it's tough. I mean, so both Onik and I, like, again, we, we had maybe what, three, four pitches a day. Um, we were at it for a solid four or five weeks. It, it really, it was tough. Like there were points where I was nervous. I got anxious. I was doubting whether or not we were pitching the right way, whether or not this idea was even solid. Um, I, we went through 17 iterations of our deck, um, right? Like we kept changing our deck because we were like, maybe that word doesn't fit there. Maybe the slides need to be changed around. Maybe we got to add a new slide. Maybe the slide needs to be simpler. We were constantly asking for feedback from people who rejected us. We had about 41 rejections for this round in total. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Before we get into today's conversation with TrueFan CEO, Swish Goswami, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to leave us a positive rating and review. Share this episode with one friend and subscribe to the show. I put out brand new interviews every single Monday and a brand new takeaways episode is an audio exclusive where I sit down and break down the most recent podcast episode of the week every single Thursday. And now without further ado, I'm very excited to present to you my conversation with Swish Goswami. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. And today on the podcast, we are joined by TrueFan CEO and co-founder Swish Goswami. We had Swish on the podcast back in March of 2020. He's back today, fresh off the announcement of a $2.3 million seed round, which we're going to dive right into today. Swish, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate it. Am I your first repeat guest? No, you're not. Actually. Never mind. Don't answer. Stop. It was it, it was Buster. Buster was oh. the first repeat. Okay, I'm fine losing the hand. That's fine. That's totally fine. <laughs> um, but no. So first off, man, obviously, congrats on the raise. Like that's huge news. Um, and so we're gonna start. I want to start with the raise today. And so I have some stuff from the press release here. So it was an oversubscribed round, primarily filled with Manetta Ventures, um, participation from GP Protocol Ventures, Athlete Tech Group. For people that don't know, what does an oversubscribed round mean? Yeah, it's a great question. So we initially set out to raise 1.5 million USD. And we ended up actually raising about 1.8 million USD, equates to about 2.3 million Canadian. Um, and so an oversubscribed round is essentially whenever you set a goal, if you decide to raise more than that goal, um, based on the you know investor interest that you get, people that want to get in on the round, um, it's oversubscribed. Um, again, I think it's just lingo to say that like we're popular, um, but generally speaking, like this round, I don't think was easy for us. It, it was something that looked like by the end, I think we got a lot of great interest, which is why the round became oversubscribed. But like initially, I mean, we, we found it pretty difficult to raise around November, December when people were going for holidays. So it did, it did take us about three months to get to a verbal commitment and then obviously an additional month to go through all the legal process associated to the raise. And so for, for an oversubscribed round, what's the consideration going into that? Like, obviously like more money, great, but like that I'm assuming comes with more dilution, right? So like, how do you weigh whether to exceed your funding goal or not? It's the type of partners you bring on. So, you know, Mineta came on and candidly speaking, they led the majority of the round. So we honestly could have stopped right there um, and we didn't have to take anyone else on, but we decided to bring some other people on like, you know, we, we brought on uh, Derek Favors from the Utah Jazz, Thaddeus Young from the Chicago Bulls, Curtis Christofferson, who's the CEO of Innovative Fitness, GP Ventures, Protocol Ventures. We decided to bring some of these angels and smaller institutions on because we felt like they would open up a lot more sales channels. They really understood what we were building and could honestly give us a lot of great product feedback. It could also help on the hiring and talent side as well. So we just felt like they would be good strategic partners. That was kind of the biggest thing that I wanted to prioritize in this round is I wanted to make sure that we weren't breeding people on just because they had money. We were breeding them on because we felt like they could actually provide some strategic value to truth in. And, and so you said, I mean, I like, I was actually my next question is how do you weigh between financial upside versus kind of connections and things like that? So you two questions in one with that answer, which is amazing, but you said it took three. What I do. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you said it took many months. It was, it was, it was a tough raise, especially yeah. up front. Yeah. Was it mainly just those first couple months? Was it just timing and people are going away for holidays? That's kind of what you said, or was there more factors that played into that? Definitely more factors. I think it was two other factors other than timing and people going away for the holidays. Again, December is a really terrible period to start raising money. 
um, is number one, adjusting to COVID, right? Like raising in the pandemic is so different. Like with all of our previous raises, we actually met the managing partners at these VCs. We met the angels that we brought on in person. Um, so it's kind of weird to be able to like just pitch virtually and you really get adjusted to that. And again, virtual pitches are tough as well because it's hard to keep people's interest for like a whole 30 minutes when you're pitching. Um, but we tried to, you know, mix it up a little bit. So that was number one. And then I think number two, just early on our pitch deck or pitch, I don't think was, you know, hitting the right angle. And what I mean by that is normally in a pitch, you want to really talk about not only what you've done well in the past, but where you're really going. And I think we needed a bit more time to have a bit more clarity of where we were going. Obviously, this is post player. So we obviously had a clear idea that we wanted to unify player and true fans products together. But what does that actually mean in the grand landscape of things? How does it actually affect the space of customer data or the space of even marketing broadly? That was stuff that took some time. It took a lot of calls. It took a lot of feedback that we got from people to really pinpoint what type of problem we were now going after. With, with, the, with the pitch, how do you incorporate storytelling into that? Because obviously it's like, this is the market size this is what, like, what we think we can capture. Like, how do you storytell? Because I was listening to a bunch of interviews with Reed Hoffman and um, a couple other investors. And whenever they were talking about previous companies they invested in, it was never, I remember when Brian Chesky from Airbnb told me about the market size. It was like, I remember when Brian Chesky told me the story in their pitch. And that's what really sticks with them even like all these years later. So how are you incorporating storytelling into your pitch? I mean, yeah, the first 10 minutes is, is two things. It's not related to market size. It's not related to traction revenue numbers. It's not related with what we want the money for. It's entirely related to two things. One is what is Onik and I's story? So giving kind of our background, sharing it in a very honest way. And the second is giving a little bit of a background in terms of why is this solution important now? That was kind of the story arc that we built along with discussing obviously that the current problem we're seeing is unprecedented. We're seeing an apocalypse when it comes to third-party data, um, you know, third-party data across Google Chrome, uh, Firefox, Safari, you're seeing cookies go away by the end of 2022. You're seeing ad blockers continue to rise. You're seeing Apple IDFA being taken away with the next iOS update that comes out, which is about a $80 billion mobile ad tracking market gone overnight. And you're also seeing GDPR and CCPA, these two big privacy regulations, wreak havoc on Instagram and Facebook and what brands can do to advertise their products or their brand on those services. So I think we painted this picture of like the third party wasteland, if you will, um, and talked about why we believe first party data would be more important. That was the core theme of our pitch is that third party deprecation is occurring. First party data will be more important. We are the best provider of first party data out there and will continue to be a great partner for many brands. And on its, how long is a typical pitch? Like, what does that normally look like? It's normally anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes. Again, like the first 10 minutes is really important because if I can convince someone of the problem and how big it is and why our solution matters, the other stuff we felt was pretty easy. Like our, our revenue numbers are solid. We've worked obviously not just with small businesses, but some of the biggest brands in the world. And a number of investors were very like happy to see the big logos that we had on our deck um, as well. The product works, right? Like if we could demo the product and show people like, look, it actually works. It's, it's not just a, a prototype. It's not just an idea that we're pitching here. We actually have been in market and have seen things and have iterated based on the feedback we've got. And how do you kind of, especially in the first couple months when things are just going a little bit slower than you anticipate, how do you and Onik navigate that? Because from my understanding, it was a lot of long days, like back to back to back to back pitches. Like, how do you kind of, how do you navigate through that when you're not quite getting the results you want right away? It's tough. I mean, so both Onik and I, like, again, we, we had maybe what, three, four pitches a day. Um, we were at it for a solid four or five weeks. It, it really, it was tough. Like there were points where I was nervous. I got anxious. I was doubting whether or not we were pitching the right way, whether or not this idea was even solid. Um, I, we went through 17 iterations of our deck, um, right? Like we kept changing our deck because we were like, mm, maybe that word doesn't fit there. Maybe the slides need to be changed around. Maybe we've got to add a new slide. Maybe the slide needs to be simpler. We were constantly asking for feedback from people who rejected us. We had about 41 rejections for this round in total, which I'm very proud of talking about because, again, I think those 41 rejections allowed us to get our first big yes with Mineta and then start to obviously go from there and start to get other people in. Um, because, again, the feedback we got from those 41 partners that said no was so instrumental to us understanding, okay, cool, like, you know, 
it's easy to take the easy route and say, oh, like they just didn't get it. But it's obviously harder and probably in your interest to say, what could I do better the next time to make sure they actually get it? To make sure they actually understand our idea, understand where we're going, understand why we're important. That was the key thing for us to realize. And that's why these deck iterations, um, the rejections we got are things that I'm, I'm very proud to talk about. And with all the feedback you're getting, I mean, that's 41 rejections. That could be multiple people at different firms. You're getting input and <laughs> feedback from so many different people. Yeah. You know, I ended up podcast with Mikhail Cho, who co-founded Unsplash. And he said one thing they dealt with, especially early on, was mentor whiplash, where you have two people who are like equal in stature, both telling you different things, and you don't know which feedback you're supposed to take in and implement. So how do you, like, what processes do you have in place for in taking feedback and applying it to both your pitch and also the product? Yeah, I mean, so two things. One is normally we didn't deal with too many multiple partner conversations. Um, so we normally ask the partner that liked us first, like, because normally what would happen, right, is you go from an associate, the associate likes you, they breed in one partner. And if the one partner likes you, then it goes to an investment committee where the one partner will basically back the idea, present it, and share it with the other partners. So I don't necessarily care that much to ask the people who rejected our idea why they rejected it, because that's feedback I can hear from the partner as well that presented it. Like, what, what happened in the investment committee? Like, why, why, why did our idea get shot down? That's stuff that, that can easily be relayed through that person. What I'm a little bit more interested in is what did that person see in our idea that made them want to proceed to the investment committee, right? Like, why did they like our idea up to a certain point? That's what I really want to know so that I know what exactly to definitely avoid um, or what things to think about in terms of feedback and how we can improve. But also, what are things that we should double down on that people like hearing about that we should definitely make sure we continue to put forward the next time? And how are you tracking all of this? One, obviously, there's the feedback component you're tracking, but you're also tracking the relationships, who said what, who you need to follow up with. Like, how do you, how do you manage all of that? Yes, I did not build a, a tracker, which was a huge mistake. Uh, and you know, I'm actually helping a company out right now. It's more of a side project. I'm coming on as a founding partner for this company focused around student debt. Uh, and in the process of helping them raise their pre-seed round, I actually first told them, before we go out and use this deck and raise any money, I want you to build a chart tracker. <laughs> it's like a Google Doc spreadsheet. You know, here are all the people we talked to, their organization. Did we already get in a phone call with them? Were they interested? Yes or no? And then how much do they want to come in for and what valuation? And have all of that charted down. For me, what I did is I did two things. I had a Word document. In the Word document, I wrote down every single person I've talked to. And then literally, if they rejected me, I put them into a column that just said rejected and put down their feedback for why they rejected us. Um, and then the ones that I thought were really close to closing, I like bolded them in red so that I would double down and really focus my time on continuing to email them uh, and make sure that they got back to me. So that was number one. And then number two, superhuman. You know, I can't say enough about superhuman and how helpful it was for being able to set follow-ups that like, I literally could just go command H, remind me to get back to this email again on Friday and it would pop up at the top of my inbox and I could immediately follow up. So Superhuman was just a fantastic tool when it came to like following up with people, making sure they got back to me um, all through email and all through pretty much an automated manner. That's awesome. And so when an investor does say yes, you get that the green light, what does that process look like then from them just saying that you get a verbal commitment, but then like, is it just a bunch of legal stuff and that's what happens after? Like, what does that process look like from yes to actually getting the money? Yeah, I mean, it was so cool because with Mineta, like we got in a Zoom call with them at like 9 p.m., 9.30 p.m. Um, and obviously it was awesome because, you know, they had their managing partner as well as the partner that had worked on our deal in terms of pitching us to the investment committee. Um, and they told us, yeah, we want to go forward. Here are kind of the high level terms. Um, some people agree to it on the call. Some people wait if they're trying to set other offers. We really liked Mineta. Mineta was on the top of our list for who we wanted to get on because we really liked their backgrounds. They were all operators. They all ran enterprise SaaS companies before. And they were really humble and candid. Like Mineta was the first firm that told me what they were not only good at, but what they sucked at. So I love that. Like it was refreshing to hear a VC be like, we're not a partner if you're looking for X, Y, Z. And just being very honest and candid with us. So we immediately said yes to them uh, over the call because the terms were, were just great. We liked it on, on both sides. And we decided to move forward to paperwork on the term sheet. So past that, you need the term sheet signed. There was a bit of a back and forth in the term sheet over like provisions and specific items within it. Um, but then past that, this round actually took a bit longer on the legal side. Normally you wrap up kind of a week or two after you're done, you, you wrap up all the legal work. 
Um, this was our first round where we were actually doing a priced round. So we weren't raising off a convertible note or a safe agreement. Um, all those previous agreements, all the safe holders, all the convertible note holders were actually being converted in this round because it was a price round. The valuation of the company had finally been set. So there was a lot more legal work associated to not only making sure Mineta's transaction went through, but all the previous safe holders were converting properly and everyone was looked out for. That was the, kind of the biggest reason why our, our legal took up about a month, month and a half, honestly. And talking about the timing of the raise, how do you determine when to start your next round? Because I've heard in the past, you say that early in previous rounds, you've raised too early. So one, what does raising too early mean? And then how do you know when you should start your next round? So I said raising too early in the sense of just overall in terms of the company's life cycle. I think it's always good to raise at the latest possible time. Um, and I'll, I'll preface this with another point right after, but again, right? Fundraising is all about, you know, you want to fundraise when you think you'll get good terms. Right, like if, if you are doing really badly, um, and you absolutely need to fundraise, then go for it. But just note that like the worst you're doing, the worst terms you're likely going to receive. Right, you're not going to be giving up 10% of your company. You're going to be giving up 25, 30% of your company based on the traction, based on what you've done so far. So again, the reason why I suggest to early stage founders just raise at the last possible moment is because hopefully during that time you've gotten some level of a prototype out even if it's like a non-functional wireframe on Envision that people can get feedback to, you've gotten customer feedback, customer testimonials, maybe even some pilots signed, and you have the early makings of a team that ideally could grow. If you have those three elements, you're far better to raise on favorable terms than if you just had an idea in a business plan and a deck and that's it, right? And so you see what I'm saying? Like, I feel like with TrueFan, we raised a little bit too early because I feel like we could have waited a bit longer, got more people using the platform, even paying for the platform, before we decided to fundraise. Um, but then in terms of, again, right, like you want to wait till the last possible moment, but again, fundraising also does take time um, across, you know, talking to people, qualifying your offers, picking an offer, the legal work associated with post-closing. Um, it takes anywhere between kind of two to three to four months. So in a, you know, perfect world, if you were fundraising, I would, I would probably fundraise about five to six months before you feel like things are going to get really drastic like you're running out of money um and you're you're you're, you're going to be in a tough situation and true in terms of like when fundraising when you absolutely need to and the better you're doing the like the better it is for the company in terms of the raise true has been cash flow positive positive since 2019 december 2019 right so we've been cash flow positive exactly till uh december 2019 it is worth noting though after our player transaction we went back into the red so we obviously not only brought on their technology and their customers, but with player, we brought on about 11 team members, including their entire development team. So the operating expenses monthly went up, um, which made us go back into the red. But again, our goal is to get back to being profitable again. And it was cool, right? It was nice to tell investors that we had at least kind of sensed that feeling of profitability before. Um, but obviously, we decided to go back to the red because we wanted to make a bigger bet on what we could do. But even being... Cash flow positive so early is rare for tech companies, is it not? Especially like ones with the aspirations that you have, right? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, to be fair though, like we are a software company, right? So at the end of the day, um, we prioritize making money from day one. That was a big principle of mine when we started the company. And then the second thing is we wanted to be cash flow positive because we wanted to essentially control our own decision. What that means is when people aren't cash flow positive, when you're under the gun and have to raise money you're kind of at the whims of the investors to like figure out what you should be doing, where you should be going and who you take money from. I wanted to be in control of every single one of those decisions. I wanted to be cash flow positive. So, hey, we want to acquire a company. We want to raise another round. We don't even want to raise a round. We just want to continue to hire people out of revenue. I could make those decisions not being under the gun. And so obviously the decision we did make was to make our second acquisition, um, which was a, an, you know, a decision that we made knowing that we would go back into the red but obviously understanding that we had built up enough revenue uh, and runway to be able to obviously raise this round uh, in a pretty comfortable manner. And when did the opportunity for the player acquisition kind of first come across your radar? Yeah, so we closed the transaction with player um, in November of 2020. Um, and we had first spoken to Austin and Andrew, the founders of player in August of 2020. So we had spoken to them about a partnership and then about a month and a half later, they both reached out to us and said, hey, we're actually selling the company. Would you guys be interested in looking at it? So we looked at it. Again, at the time, we were only a third-party audience segmentation tool, right? We segmented data from Instagram and Twitter. That's all we did. 
we thought, hmm, third-party deprecation seems to be an issue. Um, we didn't obviously know the extent of it. Like, I feel like now, especially going through fundraising, we've learned so much about our problem. But at the time, we definitely knew about cookies, for example, going away by the end of 2022. So we did have an early suspicion that first-party data would be important, information that you directly collect from your customers, emails, phone numbers, mailing addresses, et cetera. So we decided to put in an offer, um, and we got the whole transaction for Player done in a month. So our acquisition, actually, of Player took faster than our fundraise, <laughs> um, which not many people might think that that would be the case with M&A. <laughs> How is it able to go so quickly? I think two things. One is we we got to, you know, from like a first call, giving them an offer to getting a final offer down and then having it all paper. That was like a week, like really quick. Um, and it was good because it meant that, again, both sides were happy with what they got. Right? I don't think player took a long time because they felt like they got a pretty good deal. We felt like we got a good deal. We moved on. And then the second thing is, you know, I can't take credit for this, but we worked with Osler, a Toronto law firm, their professionals, um, and they just they worked their assets off. Like they work their asses off. Obviously, you know, they, 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 take, a, they take a legal bill and uh, the legal bill was a pretty standard M&A legal bill, right? Um, but at the same time, like they work their asses off to get, you know, everything done, um, everything wrapped up really quickly. Um, it's also worth noting that the player team were very professional about the whole situation as well. Like whatever we needed, they got it back like pretty much the same day. Um, there wasn't a lot of delays in waiting around. As this is your second acquisition and the player acquisition was straight equity and the social rank acquisition was debt, right? Yeah, cash. What's the difference between those two things for anyone that doesn't understand? Yeah, so in an acquisition, you have to compensate the team, the founders, uh, the investors of that company in some way. So in the first deal, we decided to uh, compensate the company and the founders um, with cash. So we gave them you know, a set amount of cash uh, it could be in the hundreds of thousands, it could be in the millions, um, and you call it a day. Um, that transaction was an asset transfer, which meant we didn't actually take any employees or people on. We only took on their brand, uh, their website, their technology, and their customers. Uh, the player acquisition was a broader deal. Um, it was more of an aqua hire because we obviously decided to bring on their customers. We decided to bring on their brand, their website, uh, their technology, but we also took on their team. Um, and so it's worth noting with the equity deal, um, that's where you compensate someone not with cash, uh, but you compensate them with giving them equity in uh, true fan. So being able to give their entire entity, which includes their founders, their investors, potential team members that might have options, you loop them in as a whole co as one company into your cap table and give them equity in the broader business. And have with the player acquisition being one aqua hire, I think that's going to be a fun conversation to have right now because I listened back to the old podcast we did just over a year ago when we would have recorded it. And you were saying how you were about to make the first hire that wasn't a friend of you or someone within the company. So at that point, it was all people that you knew and we, you were just starting to bring on people that were outside that bubble. And so when, Talk to me about when, because you said it was 11 people. So you almost doubled the team with this, with the aqua hire. So like, as, as a leader, as a manager, like, how do you kind of intake those, like, how do you double the team size overnight? Like, what does that look like from your side? Yeah. So it was good that the majority of the people we brought on about six of them were developers, because again, we didn't have an in-house development team before we were working with outsourced developers, um, calling this team that are in Hamilton. Again, those are developers that we can call upon to be full-time anytime, but again, they weren't in-house. So we were still working through a representative at the agency that we were working with um, that was in our Slack channels that kind of was giving updates on the development side, but we didn't actually have an internal dev team. So it wasn't like, you know, players team coming in was really replacing anything. If anything, they were just adding on to having some sort of internal dev team. Um, Andrew, again, is a fantastic guy. He's our CTO now. He's an incredible professional. He was really, really like just, you know, like just great when it came to like integrating himself, talking to our existing dev team that was outsourced, trying to make sure that he was, you know, talking to every single team member uh, in the first two weeks that he started the company. He encouraged other player employees to do the exact same thing. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, in terms of the other guys, like whether it was within sales or whether it was in marketing or even the exec team, we tried to make things work by just being very honest um, about, hey guys, here's the situation. Uh, here are these new team members. Um, and one thing which I think you'll probably agree with me, Jacob, is that 
we, we try to, you know, integrate people in a pretty natural and organic manner, right? We try to bring them into team calls. We try to have fun on some of those team calls with our Friday cheers. We try to obviously talk on our Monday morning huddles. We try to be very active over Slack. So it was just nice that like the minute we brought on the player team, it just seemed like they weren't uncomfortable. Uh, it seemed like our team was very welcoming and they were just very excited to work with us. Um, and it's just been amazing to just see how well the team gelled. You know, just you obviously know being kind of in the inside of the company, like it's just the vibe is just at an all time high. And it just seems like people are really enjoying their time here, which is, which is nice to see. Yeah, it was a very seamless transition. But even with it being so seamless, does that add pressure to you? I mean, in some ways, I think, you know, just now having a team of what, 27, 28 people, um, along obviously with the player people and then some of the people we hired recently, like it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of people now. Um, so it definitely adds pressure in the sense of, you know, I don't want to make, you know, the wrong decision. I don't want to obviously cost the company anything um, because now you got kind of 28 people's jobs on the line. Uh, and it is a little bit of pressure there. But to be fair, you know, one thing which I'm really happy about is I do trust every single one of our team members right now. Um, I trust them to do their job. I trust their character, which I think is the most important thing. It's, you know, we've had hires in the past where I've doubted their character and that's obviously caused issues. Um, but I feel like right now, just with this existing team, like that sort of trust is just kind of overwhelming. So it, it definitely supersedes any sort of doubt or pressure that I feel. And when it comes to establishing true fans culture, last time you were saying how with bringing on all these new people, it was just kind of kind of be, you're obviously trying to push it in a certain direction, but you can't control the culture and how it evolves as you add people in. So has your approach to building the culture changed or have you almost doubled down on your approach from a year ago? Just double down on my approach. You know, I trust people to do their job. Um, I think I trust my executive team a lot more now than ever before. You know, I, I just, I trust them to do their job. I don't want to step on their toes. I don't want to micromanage them. I, I want them to enjoy working a true fan and build their teams in whatever way they want, talk to their teams in whatever way they want, set expectations for their team in whatever way they want. So again, I feel like just being hands off was probably the best thing I could have done. I feel like if I had controlled too many things, it would have felt like restrictive. It would have felt like I was stepping on people's toes. Um, and it also would have felt like I didn't trust them. So I think just trust, again, is the guiding principle when it comes to, you know, seamless, beautiful team culture. You just, you got to have trust as your guiding principle at all times. Is TrueFan still a startup? I think so. I think so. I think we, we have product market fit. Uh, again, right, we have two products. So it's like you have product market fit on one side. You definitely have product market fit on another side, but you obviously with player right now, it's a little bit more campaign focused. So it's, it's not an entirely automated service yet. Um, and obviously the products are being unified right now. The brands are being unified. The pricing is being unified. So there's still, there's still things that we're working out. It's not like we're an established company that's figured everything out and we're just pouring money now into marketing and trying to scale. There's still some fundamentals that we have to figure out. And that's why I think we're still a startup. But even, so even though it's still considered a startup, with the team so big now, your day-to-day -day probably looks a lot different than it did 18 months ago. How yeah, is the transition? <laughs> how has the transition been from kind of like I don't for lack of better for like scrappy entrepreneur to more so like manager? Because you're you're saying how you kind of want to give people their space and you trust them to do their jobs, but like when it's especially early stages of startup, you're involved in everything. So now as you've transitioned to being not as involved in everything, like has that been an easy transition for you to make, or has it been a little bit challenging? A little challenging, not gonna lie. Like I think I'm the type of person where you know. If I have an idea, I always like to see it through the end. You know, like if I have an idea, I want to make sure like, you know, it gets done. Um, and now, obviously, if I have an idea around product, I go to Andrew and Andrew puts it in uh, to Jira, puts it in as a task that they're going to get done. He schedules it. He prioritizes it. He talks to the team about it. If it's marketing, I go to Karen. If it's anything related to unified pricing, I go to Onik. Um, if it's anything related to you know, finance, I go to Trevor. Um, so there are just these other executives around me now that are doing a fantastic job, but it also means like, I've had to kind of, you know, get over like the feeling of like, okay, I, I'm, I have the idea. I'm going to see it all the way to the end. It's more of like, I have the idea and I'm a conduit basically for taking these ideas, sharing them, and then allowing people to have the space to be able to figure out what they do with it. So for me, like my role right now has been, you know, a couple of things. I think number one is being the gatekeeper for our vision. Um, I, I've written up documents like a key milestones doc recently, right? Where I talked about what are we doing in March? What are we doing in April? What are we doing in May? What are the key dates to remember? And what is our broad vision? Because I always want people never to feel lost. I'm constantly seeking alignment. Alignment is my best word. It is my best friend. 
It is literally the thing that, in my opinion, CEOs past a certain size need to prioritize alignment across your executive team and across your team broadly. So that's number one. Number two is obviously fundraising. Now that that's done, board meetings, right? We brought on Mineta onto the board. So, you know, those board meetings aren't just Trevor Onik and I being like, so what are we talking about? It's, uh, it's actually having a deck built out. It's having a one pager with us built out. It's making sure that our financial data is kept as up to date as possible, that our investor updates are also properly made because there's more people now that have come into the company and put their money in. Um, and then the final is, is definitely just around hiring and team management, right? Like, you know, making sure that I'm constantly being a part of the hiring process. I still like it. Um, I obviously don't do the first round interviews anymore. I do more of a third round interview, if you will. So after the first two technical interviews, I like to come in for a culture fit interview just to meet the person. Is that person, you know, is she or he a good guy? Um, are they the right person for, for the team? What are their long-term goals? These are the types of questions I ask. And I, I like just being able to figure out, like, do I see this person in our company for, like, the long run? Or do I just think they're seeing it as, like, a stepping stone to something bigger? So those are the main three things I focus on. And obviously, like, things will pop up throughout. Maybe a sales intro that I'll set up. Maybe I'll be a part of a unified branding or unified pricing conversation. But again, we have the team now where I have people that are very focused and accountable to those tasks. I don't want to, again, step on their toes and, you know, sabotage their meetings and take over their agenda. I want to be a part of these meetings. And I think the beauty now is that like 18 months ago where I was leading the meeting and talking the most, now I actually feel a lot of happiness because I want when I come into a meeting, I rarely talk that much. Like I talk mainly to align people and get them back on track if I feel like we're going off track, but that's just about it. Like I'm, I'm mainly just listening and, and it's amazing to be able to do that. With alignment and as a team grows, it obviously takes time to align different parties and Obviously, like Truven's still a startup, like we've talked about, and it's not like it's a, a 500 person company, but it's still, as you scale, the rate of making decisions slower. Like it takes longer to turn the ship versus like when you're a small startup, it's like a speedboat, not a cruise ship yet by any means. But as you grow, how do you try and still foster a culture of innovation as you still need to align people? And there's more, more people that have to be aligned to make decisions. Yeah, it's a great question because, again, I felt that as well, right? Like we're, we're a bigger team now. Um, and communication is just so important, right? Like even one person kept out of the loop on like a development update that is part of the dev team could just ruin everything and definitely ruin team vibe, team culture, et cetera. So I, I think the best answer to that is there are certain things that we have long, lengthy discussions for. There are other things where we tell people you don't need to collaborate with others. You own the space, you can get it done. So I'll give you an example. Things, for example, like if Karen, our CMO, if she wants to start an email newsletter, Talking conceptually about whether an email newsletter would be good for lead generation is something she should probably do with the executive team and then also with Marco, our director of sales. But in terms of like, what is the name of the newsletter? What is the look of the newsletter? She can figure that out on her own. She can work with her team members. She can get that done. She can come up with her own plan and move forward on that. And that's not something she needs to talk to Marco about, me about, Onik about, anyone else on the exec team about. So that's what I mean is that broadly, like with what you're doing, there's big tasks that definitely need collaboration. And then there's definitely smaller tasks that don't require collaboration unless it's within your team, which is obviously the quickest way. Because, you know, if anything, Karen, in my opinion, leads a six person startup, just called the marketing department, right? And that's the type of vibe that I definitely want to instill in her is that she can move quickly once the high level conceptual ideas are approved and, and agreed upon. Last time you were talking about how your focus in the beginning of TrueFan was a little bit more broad, like you was true fan in a couple other things, but you kind of narrowed that focus over time. And I would say even over the last year, I've, I've just anecdotally watched it narrow even further to focus more and more on true fan. How, how does that look in practice? And once we kind of get into a post pandemic world, is it going to be harder to maintain that focus as distractions are going to become more easily available when, when there's no pandemic or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. Potentially. I think the pandemic definitely helped, right? I think just being at home, um, first in Toronto, now in Calgary, um, not really having much else to do, not really seeing friends, um, really made me ultra focused on truth. Then again, like I also feel like whenever we have big things happening, like whether it's a fundraise or you know we we have a big hire coming around or it's an acquisition, I, I'm just kind of all hands on deck. Like I'm spending 17, 18 hours a day working, and I'm fine with that. Um, so I definitely come alive during those moments. But you know, even moments like this right now, like. 
I think in practice, what it looks like is just prioritizing my week. You know, every single day before I go to bed, I look the next day, right? And I look at my calendar and I say, okay, hey, these meetings that I'm taking, are they actually necessary? Do I actually need to take them now or can I take them later? And right now, the majority of the meetings that I'm prioritizing are focused on truth in, which just, again, means that at the end of the week, when I look back at what I've done, most of the stuff that I've done is going to be focused around truth in. It doesn't mean, however, that I'm only focused on truth in. And what I mean by that is like, I do have other things on the go. Like I'm investing in a few companies right now. One of which, like I talked about, is focused around the student debt crisis. And I'm really excited because we're hoping to raise a bigger seed round in June. And hopefully we'll start announcing more about what we're doing then. Um, I'm still speaking virtually, still trying to get my book out because it got delayed due to COVID. And I'm hoping it comes out next year. Still posting on social media. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a host for a Tech Toronto show coming out in April. So I still find time to do other things things. Um, but I try to use my weekends more for that, um, as opposed to my weekdays where I just, especially from nine to five, I really want to be there for the team, make sure that they can book meetings with me if need be. Uh, and also just making sure that I'm getting through my to-do list that's relevant to true fan first before focusing on anything else. With the pandemic, there's one other question I have regarding the pandemic. It was when it first kind of hit, everything was very uncertain. You and Onik made the decision not to take salary during, for the first couple months, I believe. Walk me through that decision. Yeah, we didn't want to lay anyone off. That was the most important thing is that we liked our team a lot. Um, and it's not to say that we were ever close to it. Like, I don't think we were close to, to having to lay someone off, per se. Um, like, you know, I also just didn't want to be in an uncomfortable position where I was like, imagine like marketing wants to put in more money into like ad spend, uh, and they want to put in like 5, 10, 15k more. I didn't want to have something in the back of my head that said, I can't say yes to this because that means then we're getting very close to potentially laying someone off. So I just thought in general, it'd be great. You know, if Anik and I, we had money saved up, just went off salary um, and just delayed that salary, right? And just it didn't take a paycheck. And, uh, you know, when things were right, we could take that pay then. Um, but again, like it definitely was something that we consciously did so that we wouldn't have to be in a dire situation ever which, you know, I'm, I'm happy we weren't because again, it, it allowed us to move with confidence, right? Throughout COVID, I think we moved with confidence. We, we didn't wait for problems to come to us. We went directly to problems and fixed them. Um, we set up a virtual event. We launched an affordable pricing plan. We launched a free plan. Like we were aggressive um, since the beginning of COVID. Um, and that's something that I feel like we probably wouldn't have done if we felt doubtful of being able to even make it through the next six months financially. And as far as I can recall, I could be wrong on this, but you didn't broadcast that to the team, right? That you guys weren't taking salary as far as I can remember, right? You guys kind of kept yeah, on the down though? I it's actually pretty interesting that you even know about it. I don't know. I, I don't think we told the entire team ever. Um, we told select members of the team after a few weeks, but initially, no, we wanted to keep it to ourselves. Obviously our CFO Trevor knew about it because he, he does payroll. <laughs> um, but other than that, we didn't tell anyone. Again, it wasn't something we didn't, we didn't want to tell people also because it's like, there wasn't really a reason to be fearful that we would run out of money. Um, but again, like, I also just didn't want people to know that because I didn't want them thinking like, oh, like we're in a dire situation when we weren't. But like, again, right, it's just, it's weighing what people would have thought versus what I would have thought if we were slowly getting to that position, which we might have if marketing wanted to double their spend, if product wanted to double their spend, like, I didn't want to have to say no to people like that, um, especially if they had good ideas around what they wanted to do, because I felt like we wouldn't have been able to make it financially. And so, I mean, it was a hectic couple of months, but beginning of pandemic, early summer, correct me if I'm wrong, but you went back to Calgary early summer, right? And that was, was that like a, a burnout prevention or a burnout recovery move or something like that? Burnout recovery move in July. Um, I think it was, yeah, March June was crazy. It wasn't like it was, it was hectic. It was fun. It wasn't like I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. Um, it was just a lot of work. <laughs> like, you know, to, we, like, again, we launched this monthly virtual event series. We marketed a, a 45 day free access for our platform to any small business under 20,000, uh, under 20,000 followers. We decided to take that idea and then roll it into a broader free plan along with an affordable pricing plan with the affordable pricing plan came figuring out what our customer success team was going to do because they were only used to enterprise before. So there was a lot of work that we had to do. And again, I think it's indicative of the team, you know, the team stuck it through, um, the, you know, there's more than just me when it comes to what we did and, and being proud of it. I think it's a team effort, but I, I definitely felt like I, I had a bit of a 
hard time when it came to disconnecting from work during those months. So just in the process of working many hours, uh, also being at home, um, not maybe eating the most healthy food, because again, in Toronto, I wasn't really cooking. I was just Uber Eatsing every day. Um, I did kind of get to a point where I felt like, okay, I need to go back to Calgary. I need to have some home cooked meals. I need someone to really kick me in the butt like my mom to make sure that I'm accountable to my health. And I also need to make sure that I'm, I'm sleeping properly and, and just not burning out. Two things based off that. One, I think it's important for everyone to hear that you can still burn out even if you're having fun and enjoying what you're doing. Yeah, 100%. And yeah. the other thing too was I'm trying to think of what, oh, as the CEO of the company, you said you were enjoying what you're doing. You're the CEO. It's like an important time for the company. Is it a hard realization to come to that, oh, I've burnt out? Because you're enjoying what you're doing. You're supposed to be leading this company. Is it hard to admit that to yourself? No, I'm pretty honest. Like I'm, I'm just, you know, like I'm, I'm pretty honest with myself. I'm not embarrassed about stuff like this. Again, I'm human. I'm like a human being. I'm very happy to say if I'm burning out or if I'm feeling anxious or doubtful, like, you know, every three weeks we have our hopes and fears session, right? Like I, I try to sh- be as vulnerable as I can because I expect other team members to do that. Right. So it kind of needs to start with me. So I didn't mind, like I made a public post on Instagram, even just saying like I burnt out, like, you know, and I'm, I'm, like, I'm not embarrassed about it. Like people do it. Um, if anything, like, you know, I was proud about what I did to burn out, right? Like I I worked, I worked my ass off. We got a lot done with our team. I was proud about what we got done. Uh, you know, I definitely could have managed my workload a bit better, which was the thing I took away from that experience. Um, but again, like I wasn't embarrassed by burning out whatsoever. And talk to me a little bit more about burnout prevention. Now you took your break from Instagram in January. Was that part of the reason or was that just like, fundraising is coming to a close. You're actually to focus. So like what led to the social media break? Yeah. So, I mean, burnout recovery in general, like I just learned how to, you know, like eight hours of sleep is important. Seven hours at least, right? Like I, I don't think three hours, four hours is something that people should be doing. You'll catch up to you in the long run. It'll definitely harm you. Um, so that was number one. I think, you know, eating healthy was definitely important as well. Going on walks. Like that's actually one thing I did when I came back from Toronto, September, you know, October, November, December, I just went on walks like almost every day, um, got out at 5 p.m., had some sunlight, got some fresh air, came back. Um, and that just helped really in terms of disconnecting from work, getting some fresh air, walking, obviously you know, putting in some exercise. Um, so that was good. And then, yeah, in terms of the social media break in the new year, you know, this was around our, the middle of our fundraise. Um, start of Jan, we had about like 14, 15 potential lead investors that we had already talked to at least once. Uh, the majority of those uh, we had talked to at least twice. We were getting to the point where I'm like, okay, I really need to put in work now. Like people are asking for specific documents. They have a bunch of questions they need answers to. They're asking for this financial report. Need to get Trevor to work on that. Need to manage the team and make sure everyone else is doing well. Like I just felt like with everything going on, the last thing I needed to be doing was being distracted on Instagram for like an hour or two a day. So I decided to, you know, deactivate Instagram temporarily. Um, and that month was great. You know, again, like what, January 15th, 16th, we got a verbal commitment from Mineta, like we're ready to go, um, which was a great feeling. And then I actually stayed off Instagram even past that to just get the initial part of the legal work wrapped up, um, to come back to Calgary. And then once I came back to Calgary was, you know, eating really well, feeling good. I came back on Instagram. Um, and even now, like I look at kind of how many hours I spend a day. It's like, what, like 45 minutes, 40 minutes on Instagram a day. Um, which, you know, still might be a lot, but definitely is a lot less than what I was spending in December and November, where I think it was like two hours or three hours a day. And I really didn't feel like I was getting much from it. And definitely sleep is super important. Like you said, because I think you hold one of the craziest sleep schedules of anybody (laughs) I've ever met. Um, but from a productivity standpoint with going off Instagram, like how much, like, can you quantify how much it helped? I mean, I can't quantify it, but maybe I can tell you this, like, I feel like my curiosity extended to so many different fields during that time. Like I actually understood what Bitcoin was in Jan. (laughs) Like I had the time to like look at articles and read about crypto and read about Bitcoin and Ethereum and understand why this was so impactful. Understand NFTs, understand, you know, more about Formula One, which is something I became super passionate about in November and December. Um, And this was like the tail end of the season as well. So I started really getting in depth in like Formula One, not only gaming and playing Xbox, like playing F1 2020, but like actually learning about like what makes a good F1 driver, what makes a good F1 team, like just understanding every nuance of even the business side of Formula One was really cool. 
Um, and then also, again, focusing on the true fan fundraise, like, you're like, you know, we got it done, like, in the middle of in the in the middle of December to January, we didn't hear back from a single investor. At the start of Jan, we had again around 16, 17 potential leads, the majority of whom we had talked to twice. And then within two weeks, about the 14, 15, 16, that was when Mineta came back and gave us a verbal commitment. So it was a super fast turnaround. Um, we had only actually talked to Mineta for the first time in early Jan. We hadn't talked to them in December. So we went from like talking to them for the first time to getting a verbal commitment within two weeks. And I generally don't think I would have been able to do that if I hadn't you know, cut down time from other places. My one other question when it comes to the break specifically, did you feel like you missed out? Because that's something a lot of people feel like when they go on social. No, because I, I actually felt like if anything, I mean, again, I, I took Instagram off, but, and I also, by the way, took push notifications off every single app. I still have push notifications off on every single app. I don't think I need, I don't need push notifications unless it's an email or a text message. That's it. Uh, or my, I, I have this poker app now. It's called Cash Live. I love it. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a, it's a daily poker game. Uh, it's basically like HQ trivia meets poker. It's a really fun app. It's started by a guy called Mark, Matt Jarvis, who's a friend of mine. He built the startup from the ground up. So I love that. That's the only other push notification I get. Um, but I, I, I feel like just whatever news I really need to learn off, I was learning from conversations I was having with people. Like I have a daily sync up even now with Zonic. Every single day I talk to him for at least 30 minutes. Um, probably even talked to him longer because again, I play Call of Duty almost every night with him. Um, and then I also, right, like throughout my business meetings, uh, even just being able to talk to my, my mom uh, or my brother, I just hear like what's trending from that. So I didn't feel like I really missed out much. Like basketball news, my brother was telling me, my mom was giving me kind of world news specific mainly to COVID because she's obviously very concerned about what's happening right now, especially in Canada. Um, and then just everything else related to marketing, social media, I was hearing it from Onik and our team and just hearing kind of like from even like the Slack channels and the articles they were sharing what was happening. So I genuinely didn't feel like I missed out on anything. Um, if anything, there were certain friends of mine that I only had on Instagram. I didn't have their phone number. So I kind of missed being able to talk to them. Um, and that's really the only reason I'm kind of back on Instagram. Like I'll make an odd post there and there. I like stories. Stories are fun. But for the most part, I'm on Instagram so that I can just message people that I have group chats with because uh, I, I have a lot of happiness with talking to some of these people. Is there a, like, what's the downside? Because you're not sharing a ton on Instagram right now. What is, which is rare, what's the downside of oversharing on social? I don't think there's a downside with oversharing, really. Like, unless it obviously, you know, hurts your mental health, then don't do it. Um, but again, like, I love Buster, right? Buster's the way of, he posts, he doesn't care what he posts. He just continues to share content on LinkedIn, on Instagram. That's the way you should do it. I think right now, it's just honestly, like, I don't have a lot of time to think about creatively like what I want to post um I also just generally feel like I don't have a lot of content either like normally my content before was like I'm speaking at a new event like you know and, and the event take, it takes me to like travel somewhere and I'm taking photos in a new city a new area I'm doing sharing a keynote speech sharing a video of a keynote I did sharing an interview I did at a studio like Cheddar for example at the New York Stock Exchange like I'm just not doing that stuff right now so I just I feel like again like I have personal photos um and, you know, maybe I'll share those down the road. But right now, like my mind is just so focused on business and work that I, I don't really feel like creatively right now, other than LinkedIn, where I continue to post almost every day, I really have the creative energy to post on Instagram. Is there consequences at all in any way? I mean, there are like, I bet like engagement wise, again, I, I haven't tested it out like engagement wise. I bet like if you post every day, you'll probably continue to engage your community and uh, people won't fall off. Um, you know, I, I experienced like maybe a, a say like a, a minimal follower decline last month when I came back on Instagram because people probably were like, "This guy was gone. He's not actually there all the time." Um, but now, like now that I'm back and I'm sharing stories, and I even shared a post. I've been going back up. So, like, I feel like again, the more you post, probably the more followers you're gonna get, the more comments you're gonna get, uh, the more people are gonna see your post because again, the way these algorithms work, they try to prioritize people that actively post almost every day. What about, I mean, this doesn't apply, knock on wood, but what about cancel culture? And like, what, how do you feel with that? Because we're seeing people who like, who post a ton, get things tracked back from, from years ago. So when you're posting high, high volumes, you might not remember everything that you share, which is honestly like a, that's how I get a lot of information for my podcast. Because people just share so much they don't remember. It's like, is there anything, any concern with that? Yeah, I mean, I'm 
pretty outspoken when it comes to cancel culture in the sense of saying like, look, I think it's right that people should call each other out. Um, I just feel like cancel culture doesn't solve the inherent problem. And what I mean by that is, let's assume that someone is misogynistic, right? Someone is misogynistic and they've tweeted some stuff five years ago saying, you know, women should not be paid the same salary as a man for the same work, whatever, something like that. Um, and, and, you know, everyone on Twitter starts going crazy and they're like, how can you say this? And this is wrong. And look at the study, look at these facts. That part is fine, right? And like, again, I, 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 I really would appreciate if people were respectful while doing that. Again, the internet though is a pretty harsh place. So you're going to get all types of people. I think my problem though is you, you basically put this person now that might have made a mistake, an honest mistake. Sometimes it is, right? Sometimes it really is. Five, six years ago, you put them into a box where I feel like they're not able to come out and, and you know, A, really explain themselves uh, and then B, also like just take accountability for it and, and move on. And you kind of scar them. Um, so I just feel, again, like humans, you know, we are at our best when we are not just forgiving, but we also continue to educate people on why they're wrong. And again, I feel like right now with cancel culture, we're only doing one of those. We're, we're, we're just educating people on why they're wrong. We're not forgiving. So I think it needs to be, needs to be both together. Again, certain things I think you, you, you have a hard time coming back from. I'm not going to condone, obviously, extreme actions. But like things like, you know, an odd tweet back in the day. I mean, a lot of people right now are deleting their old tweets. Like I literally know people that are deleting their old tweets in fear that someone is going to bring it up and they'll be canceled, right? And like, I think all people make mistakes. I've made mistakes in the past. I think, you know, I've said some inappropriate things probably in the past. And I remember that in high school and early parts of college, if it was, you know, for example, rapping the N word or, or saying it as a punchline of a joke, you know, I remember there were days back in the day where I thought maybe, oh, that's funny. But like realizing now that it's wrong is something that I actually was able to come to through experience, through learning, and through an understanding that, hey, these issues are really impactful, right? Like, learning more, by the way, during COVID about the Black Lives Matter movement, and understanding why is it so important? What are they truly fighting for? Why does this really cut deep for many people? That's the type of stuff through education that gets people to really understand why they were wrong for what they did. And again, for me, like I understood obviously a long time ago why I was wrong for anything I said before. Um, but again, I think it's just, again, like it's on people to call each other out for mistakes they made. But I think it's also on people to make sure that we, we call people out, but we also give them the opportunity to change. We give them the opportunity to be forgiven. Um, and again, that's, again, I think where, where humans are at their very best when they do that. Um, so again, that's the way I conduct myself too, is like whenever I, I notice something wrong with a friend of mine or I notice something wrong with someone on, online, I, I definitely try to call them out uh, privately normally initially. I don't try to keep things public, but privately I try to call them out, but I also try to be sympathetic, right? I try to hear their side of the story first. I try to also tell them why I thought they were wrong. And then I forgive them and move on and try to see, is there any change in their character or behavior? If they're acting the same way, I don't like to associate myself with those people. But if, they're, if, they, if they've changed, then great. It's a win-win for everyone. And that's, in my opinion, what I think people should do when it, when it comes to really thinking about cancel culture is, is really changing that whole paradigm around it and making it a little bit more you know, forgiving than just canceling people out. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's around, to your point, the sympathy, the forgiveness, the education. It's also on the person who made the mistake to be open to change. I think that's a huge component to it. Yeah. But for you specifically, as the CEO of a company with multiple NBA players that have invested in this company, do you have any fear of people tracking down your old basketball mixtape where I believe you shot only 25%? can't believe you would bring this up. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's on YouTube. I, I, I really like that video because we made it as a joke because I always liked the NBA Raptors TSM soundtrack and I thought it was epic. And then I like the CNBC soundtracks. So I thought, why don't I make a mixtape where like I miss a few shots on purpose and then make a shot and it'll have the TSN Raptors soundtrack when I'm making it because I love the Raptors. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, like with the, with the NBA players that have come on, I, I feel like just some of them think I can ball because my name is Swish, but they're, they, they don't realize the full truth of probably how bad I am right now, especially because I haven't played a, I haven't played basketball probably in over a year. I haven't touched a basketball definitely in like eight months. <laughs> How often do you reflect on the whole journey? You know, from like, even if we go look at it from, from you in that gym, shooting those shots, missing those shots to where you are now, 
where it's just everything that's happened. I mean, you, you had a startup food shares, you sold your wearables company, you were in New York working for a VC firm starting to, how often do you take the moment to kind of look back on the whole journey? Um, I do it actually sometimes when I come to Calgary, weirdly enough, because then when I walk in Calgary, I obviously, I go by like the old places where my bus stop was in junior high um, or where I played basketball after school when I was in high school um, or just, you know, the restaurants that I went to for my birthdays back in the day. And I, I, you know, I think a little bit about like, whoa, like, damn, time flies, you know, like I'm, I'm 23 turning 24. Like I've been out of college now for, well, I've been like, I've been out of college for some time, but like my, my graduating class has been out of college for, for, for two years now, which is pretty crazy to think. So I definitely reflect on stuff like that. I also just feel like I, I don't want to think too much about it because I just think there's so much to be excited about going forward. And I think everyone should have that feeling, right? Like, I think you should be very appreciative of what's happened in the past. You should reflect on it, take mistakes that you've made and learn from them and become better. And obviously, you know, reflect on those positives and remember that you're a good person. You work hard, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Affirmation should definitely come from past experiences. But I think you should also be very cognizant of reflecting on the future. Um, and what I mean by that is it just know like how, you know, how, how, how great the future could be if, if X, Y, Z falls into place and, and then start to think about what you need to do to make those things fall into place. That, that, that's what makes me very excited. And that's more actually what I think about than reflecting on the past. I like that. And I will say one thing, it was a weird realization for me when I realized I've been out of high school longer than I was in it. That was, <laughs> that was a weird one to get through. Um, yeah. I mean, to be fair, I've been out of school now for longer than I was in university for. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. I think it's just also funny because now I'm like starting to be friends, like settle down even um, like 24, 25, like they're getting engaged, man. Like literally in the summer, of 2020, I saw like every single day on Facebook, at least one person getting engaged. I'm just like, yo, am I doing it wrong? Like, do I need to find a girl and get engaged? Um, but it's cool. Like, it's, it's cool to see that. It's also just like, whoa, like, think, you know, we're getting older. But then, you know, I, I double my age and I'm still younger than my mom and everything gets put into perspective. You know, like that, that's pretty crazy when you think about it that way, too. Or when people start having babies, like my best friend from high school just had a kid and I was like, what is we are still kids we can't be having kids yet you know it's like, just, like like what what is that like, like who whose kid is that like what? yeah <laughs> yeah it's just it's just crazy man yeah but yeah and you mentioned your mom and you mentioned your brother can you talk about the impact they've had on your life like your brother especially i'm curious about because like from my understanding like when you were a kid he kind of talked to your parents and was like i think swish is going to have a bit of an untraditional path from my understanding he was also kind of convinced was one of the reasons that you, he gave you kind of the, the clearance to drop out. Like you kind of co-signed that decision. Can you tell me about the impact he's had on you? Yeah. I mean, brother has been my best friend from day one. Um, very competitive with me even now, but definitely when I was growing up, very competitive in a friendly way. We, we never, we never, like, honestly, like my brother and I rarely fought. Like, like the thing about us is like we fight and then like three hours go by and I'll come by and we'll just apologize to each other and move on. Like it was, we never had like fights that ever got too deep. Um, and, and we just had a lot of fun, you know, like growing up, we, we played mini hockey in our, in our apartment. Like this was also, by the way, when he was in high school, right? Like, <laughs> like it was like, he was a kid, like he was in high school taking time out specifically. Like I remember reading some of his old diaries and it was like, make time to hang out with Manny, um, which is what he calls me. It was just so nice to just see like, you know, he was always there looking out for me, always hanging out with me. Um, obviously he became a mentor for me as a, in debate because he was my coach in high school for team Canada, someone I looked up to in debate. Um, and then in university, I was fortunate obviously to enter university when he was in law school at the same college, right? University of Toronto. And it was just cool being able to meet his friends, become friends with his friends and have like kind of one big circle that we were all a part of. Um, but yeah, you're right, man. Like when it came to leaving school and pursuing entrepreneurship full time, um, he was definitely one of the reasons I was able to do that. I think, you know, definitely the understanding of my mom, uh, and I'm very appreciative of her to understand where I was coming from and to allow me to do this. And then I definitely think the kind of belief that my brother had in terms of like, yeah, I think this is the path for you. I don't think law school is going to be right for you. Um, and just backing me on my, on my assumptions, it went a long way. And again, like, I know that I can do anything. Like I can, 
you know, I can sell custom lapel pins and my brother will still support me and my mom will still love me. And that type of feeling is always great because it just makes me feel like, you know, I'm being supported, not just for what I do, but just generally speaking who I am, which I, which I really appreciate it. What's your thought on, on legacy? Cause it's some question I often wrestle with. Cause you're, you're often told to focus on yourself. Don't care what other people think, but then on the flip side you hear focus on your legacy, which is entirely what mm-hmm. other people think of you. So like, where did you yeah. land on when thinking about your legacy? I don't think you can form your legacy. I really don't. I've been thinking so much about it. Like you could have the greatest clubhouse bio and the greatest LinkedIn bio and people just wouldn't give a shit. Like I realize what people generally remember you for are the interactions they have with you, which is why like, even now, I try to make time to talk to strangers, right? Like, like you'll like, I don't know if you notice this, but when I made my Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn posts talking about the acquisition and then even the fundraise recently, I tried to reply to every single person who commented, like, just thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your support. Smiley face, even just so that like people didn't feel like, you know, I was going down my path and not recognizing the support that I had been given because I have definitely been given a lot of support. So I, I think it's just important to realize that when you know you put a best legacy comes down to what people think about you, the simplest way to build the best legacy is just treat people in the right way, right? Treat, treat people in the right way, um, support them, be there for them, especially during this time. And I think your legacy will naturally be built. And again, I, I, I personally would take the legacy of being a, a helpful, kind, you know, curious person than being a, a, a rude, arrogant billionaire, generally speaking, like, like, I, I'm not in it for the money. If I wasn't in it for the money, I would have, you know, I would have, I would be doing things a lot differently, right? Like taking pay cuts and stuff like that wouldn't have been on my mind. So I'm, I'm generally not in it for the money, at least right now at this age, I'm, I'm in it more for the experiences, the people I get to meet, things I'm able to do. Um, and that I hope will in turn down the road, uh, put me on the right path to having a respectable legacy. I know we're a little over time. So I'm just going to jump to the last question that I ask everyone at the end of every podcast. I don't think I actually asked it to you last time. Yes, this question, Jacob, I will absolutely come on a third time. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> I was, I was going to make a joke at the end that you could be the first three P guest. Let's go. Three P interview. Go. Cause there's people that have been go. on multiple times, but no one's been done three interviews. Let's do it tomorrow. I don't think anyone's been an interviewed twice in two days. <laughs> never, never. That's never happened. Yeah, I can make that work. Your last question. Sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> no, dude, that's all good. So the last question, I like to flip the script a little bit. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question, but it's not to me. Pretend you yep. have a crystal ball. You can ask the crystal ball any question and you'll get the 100% honest answer. What is one question you want to know the answer to? Oh man, crystal ball. And this is to anyone or is like, do I have to target it to someone? No, no, no. So you, this is like a question you want to know. So you can ask the question or whatever you want, like what you personally want to know and the crystal ball will give you the honest answer. Mm. I don't know if I can frame this in a question yet, but I've always thought like I'm incredibly ambitious and I'm always scared that maybe when I'm 35, I'll regret things that I didn't do. Um, like, you know, even right now, like, like just relationships wise, like things that I'm not, be able to spend too much time on or focus on. And, and I've done a fairly bad job in the past of managing um, when it comes to personal relationships. Um, I've thought a little bit about that. Like, will I regret stuff like that? So I guess maybe my question would just be like, you know, what is the cost of ambition? That's probably the question that I would ask. And, you know, I, 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 would, I, would, I, I would personally think that I would get multiple answers to that, varied answers to that. Um, but I'm trying to figure that out as well, because I want to make sure that I'm not 35 when I realize the answer to that. That's a great question. No one's ever asked, like, especially in that way, like no one's ever looked, approached that question that way. So I really, I really like that. But I want to thank you so much, man, for taking time to be on the podcast for the second time, which is part of a trilogy. I must say there will be a third of you. Um, where I can mean, the, people- the Return of the King is by far the best movie. So I'm just saying. Like- there you go. <laughs> 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 which movies we didn't get the chance to talk about movies, which is something I wanted to, and maybe we'll save that for the third one, but I want to give you the floor. Where can the people find you plug anything and everything you got right now? Yeah. I mean, true fan, if you want to, if you want to learn more about true fan, just uh, reach out to truefan.io, T R U F A N dot I O. Um, and then social media wise, if you want to reach out to me, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, at go swish G O S W I H, or just type in swish on LinkedIn. I should be the only swish on LinkedIn. Um, if you see another one, feel free to let me know as well, because I want to report that person and have them take it down. <laughs> so yeah, but reach out. 
I, again, very trying to, I'm trying to speak to new people every single week. So if you reach out and just said, Hey, I listened to my social life. And, um, even if you hated what I said here, I would love to hear from you and then we can have a combo. Awesome, man. I want to thank you once again for taking the time. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Whether you've listened the entire way through or you only listen to bits and pieces, I really appreciate you taking time to check this out. Everyone do me a big favor. Go and follow Swish. Go and follow True Fan. I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below so you can find it. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me everywhere on social media at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. As always, today's podcast is powered by True Fan. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.